No wildflower shows more clearly than foxglove the significance in the evolutionary history of the flowering plants of the development of bilateral symmetry, or zygomorphy to use the more technical term. Now, of course, we can examine foxglove at leisure in our gardens, but nothing beats the sight of foxglove in the wild. And to do that, we have to make our way to Sleeve Bloom, where foxglove thrives in the acidic, rocky soils of the glens. So, the large flowers are produced in these tall, elegant spires, and they mature from the bottom upwards, which means that on any one spike you're go going to see flowers at all stages of development, and this enables you to follow the progress of what's happening in, in, the, in the flower much more easily uh, than it would otherwise be, or than it would be in, in smaller flowers. Uh, so if we take one of those flowers, you can see they're thimble shaped uh, and they're bumblebee sized, which means that only bumblebees can really fit comfortably inside. And in fact, they are the intended pollinators and the only legitimate visitors are bumblebees. Uh, if you can look at the front of the lower lip there, you'll see the way in which it's extended forward as a landing platform for the bees. And to make their arrival more convenient, you can see that that landing platform has long hairs on it, which enable the bee to get a purchase with its front legs as, as it clambers up into the bell itself. And you'll see the way in which once it's up into the bell, the floor of the bell and the walls to a lesser extent are ornamented by this extraordinary pattern of spots and speckles. Going right to the back of the flower, and notice the way each of those, it's easier to see when you look at the individual speckles, each of them is surrounded by a halo, a white halo, which is translucent. Yeah? It's translucent. So the bee lands moves its way towards the back of the flower in search of the nectar. And the nectar is produced by a flesh ring around the ovary. Now if you look into the flower, even from the entrance, uh, you can see the exit at the back. Because through the exit at the back you can see the ovary. Uh, and that, of course, is where the bee is heading because if we take away the corolla, the nectar is stored here. This essentially is the flask where the nectar is stored. So it's secreted by a fleshy ring, which you can see there at the base of the ovary. And then it's stored in this little, this little uh, hollow where the corolla tube constricts at the back. If we look a bit more closely now, I've taken away the corolla, but that helps to appreciate the next point, because if we now split the corolla into two, separate the upper from the lower lip, uh, you can see that in the roof, in the roof, you have the four stamens. Uh, they are. You can see they're in pairs. You have the two longer outer ones and you've got two somewhat shorter inner ones. Now, just before the flower opens, those anthers, the anthers there, were at right angles to the filament. But as the flower begins to open, they move through 90 degrees so that the anthers are more or less parallel to the filaments at this stage of the flower's development. And if you look in again, okay, if we look in again, you see the way the base of the outer anthers goes in towards that constriction at the back, uh, in order to corral the bee towards the centre. In other words, to move the bee into the maximum position for effective pollination. It's all, they almost look like, like the, 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 the handrails on, on, uh, on an escalator. And that positions the bee in the maximum position to pick up the pollen. Now, the flower is protandrous, which means that the male parts mature before the female. Uh, and they mature successively in pairs. The longer outer pair matures, matures first, sheds its pollen, and only later uh, does the second, a shorter pair, mature and shed its pollen. And it's only at that stage that the, that the stigma becomes receptive. It moves to the front of the flower and the two receptive surfaces at the tip of it open in order to be able to pick up pollen. Now, the significance of that uh, protandrous condition in a spire like this is that you're going to have the older flowers at the bottom, which are in the, the female stage. And 
Only further up are you going to have the flowers that are in the male state produce, producing pollen. Now, the instinct of the bee is always to begin at the bottom of a spike or spire like this and move upwards. So when the bee arrives, uh, it's going to visit flowers in the female stage and if it's carrying pollen from another plant, that will be transferred to the stigma and cross-pollination will take place. And then as it moves further up, it can bring, take up a new load of pollen and hopefully in the course of time um, visit other, other plants. So the chances of uh, outcrossing or cross-pollination taking place are maximised by this sort of arrangement. But suppose it's a, a, a miserable wet summer and bumblebees are in short supply and don't visit the flowers. Well, it's, it's then that you, you, you see the significance of the attachment of the stamens uh, to the corolla. Because the flower will be open for about six days. And at the end of that time, what's going to happen, we, let's assume no visitors have arrived, uh, it, it, it sheds its corolla skirt. And in doing so, in doing so, notice now what's left behind is the style and stigma. As the style and stigma. And so as the corolla skirt slips off, what can now happen uh, is that pollen on the shorter stamens can be transferred to the stigma as it passes it by and self-pollination can take place. So the result of this, one way or another, the likelihood is that all the flowers are going to be pollinated and will develop a, a, a full set of seeds in the capsule. It's difficult for us to imagine what the bee actually sees when it visits foxglove. Uh, and a large part of the reason for this is that the bees can't see red. But what they can see is the humanly unimaginable colour that stands at the opposite end, the other end of the spectrum of human vision. In other words, bees can see in ultra ultraviolet. Um, to get us the beginning of a sense of how differently the bee sees, if we take a, a small torch and shine it into the bell, you can see that it doesn't really make a great deal of difference. And when the bee is actually occupying the entrance to the bell, of course, the interior is going to be dark, or so you would think, except that if we now shine the torch from the outside, you can see that the light penetrates the translucent white halos that surround those purple splotches. So the back is still lit, as it needs to be when the, when the bee is, is inside. Now, if we factor in, into that the fact that the bee is not seeing red and is seeing ultraviolet, you get a sense of just how different the bee's vision is from our own. No wildflower has a more potent pharmacological reputation than foxglove uh, because it is the main natural source of digitalin which is a powerful uh, cardiac stimulant that has been in use in medicine since the late 17th century and is still widely used. Um, another chemical that it contains and this is in the seeds uh, is a chemical <coughs> called loliolide which is a powerful ant repellent and this of course helps the security of the seed bank. As for the foxes of the name, uh, it has nothing to do with the fox animal at all. It's thought to be a corruption of folk's love. The folk in question being the she, the little people. And this in fact is reflected in some of the names of the plant, not least one of the Irish names, which is Marine Puka. 